Today's guest gained notoriety last year as a U.S. Marine speaking out and asking for accountability for America's disastrous military withdrawal from Afghanistan. Lieutenant Colonel Stuart Scheller is here, and I'll speak with him next. I'm Robert Child, and this is Point of the Spear. His book is called Crisis of Command, and author, Lieutenant Colonel Stuart Scheller, joins us now. Stuart, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Well, we're honored, and I say that every time, and it's true every time. Thank you for coming on. I really appreciate it. Before we get to the book and uh, what's in it, can I take you back to that moment before uh, you released the first video and uh, demanded accountability? Did you have an idea what uh, the reaction would be, and did you receive support from your fellow soldiers at the time? Yeah, so I went into that day not anticipating making a video. So this wasn't something that was pre-planned, but it was frustration that had been building for a while for really a career. Um, You know, I've got a master's in military science. I wrote a master's thesis on how to make foreign diplomacy more effective. So this is something that I've been thinking about, uh, contemplating. And in the technology era, you can just see real time the decisions that are made. So, you know, the old cliche of like, we have more information than you we've got this, don't worry about it. I just don't think it applies anymore. And so I was able to see firsthand that we were making a long list of mistakes and I could go through that. But ultimately I decided to to make a video demanding accountability. And I said in the video, if you go back and watch it, that I knew I was risking my career and my retirement, my family stability. I'd obviously thought through that. I understood the ramifications of what I was doing, but I felt like the conversation I was trying to start outweighed the potential impact to me. I feel like my generation right now, the people in their thirties and forties don't get very active because they're really afraid of being canceled. They're all worried about their stability and their individual security. And oftentimes when you do speak up, you get canceled immediately and you get, you know, ostracized. And so if you go to any type of political meeting or any type of meeting in the community, it's often people's they're the youngest are in their 50s and it goes up to 60s 70s and that's why we still have 80 year olds running this country is because to have an unpopular opinion is very risky nowadays and even if we all understand it to be true when i made the video everyone told me that they agreed with the statements but they disagreed with the method of my actions and the method was essentially openly saying this is wrong and, you know, I paid, a, I paid a price for that, but I'm not a victim. I knew what I was doing. And a lot of junior service members absolutely have been supportive, but not a single officer that is a peer of mine or higher ranking reached out and was supportive of me as a human or in terms of my message. And so that was kind of discouraging. It's that fear, again, I believe, of being canceled in the military. Uh, yep. Have anyone, any of the higher officers reached out in the intervening time in the year? I've had a couple of senior enlisted that just reached out on a human level, but no, no senior officers have reached out uh, to be supportive in any, any fashion. I see. Now you, uh, I read in an interview or I watched uh, online that you compared this time to uh, the time after the Vietnam war where, um, commanders didn't take responsibility. Could you expand on that? Yeah, I I think where the military got off track really was after World War II. Um, We could have an interesting conversation about Korea, but Korea still had a lot of World War II vets, and Truman was a World War I vet and was able to stand up to MacArthur, but MacArthur did some good things at Incheon, but then was overly aggressive. But really in Vietnam is where we got off track, and we just had generals that made a ton of mistakes. Uh, the the example I like to go back to, at least for the Marine Corps, is Quezon. We spent a couple of years there, invested thousands of lives because it was apparently a strategically important piece of terrain on the Ho Chi Minh Trail to disrupt NVA troops and supplies. And then all of a sudden, the next day, it wasn't important at all. And no one ever went back and asked the question, like, why did we invest so much if, you know, in the middle of the campaign, all of a sudden it wasn't important anymore? Same thing with the My Lai Massacre. That's like the, the quintessential case study in moral courage where people should have stood up and said something. But at the same time, the only people that were held accountable were company grade officers. 
Mm. No one above captain was held accountable for that massacre. And following Vietnam, after our inability to connect political objectives with the military campaign, instead of holding general officers accountable, we blamed it on the drugs and the draft. And we tried to imp improve the, the quality of the junior service member. That's when we went to the all volunteer force. And then the, the last time we updated our national security establishment was the Goldwater Nichols Act right after Vietnam. And all that did was really empower the general officers. It created what we know today as the combatant commands. Essentially, we divided the globe up into seven areas mm -hmm. and made generals in charge of even more responsibilities across the entire joint force. So we never went back and held them accountable. And then, you know, the list of failures just continued, whether it was Beirut, Kosovo, Somalia, obviously Iraq and Afghanistan, Libya, Syria, the list goes on and on. I mean, it, the track record is horrible and no one is holding general officers accountable to winning wars. And that's kind of been one of my messages is, hey, we really need to take a look at this because the leaders of any organization set the culture and set the tone. And right now the junior service members are winning every battle, but we're not as an American people ensuring that generals are held accountable for what we should expect from them, which is linking military campaigns with the political objectives. And I know that uh, in the book, you lay out some guidelines for taking accountability. Um, could you speak to that? Yeah, so accountability doesn't solve the problem. Accountability just addresses that there is failure. So we failed and you need to be held accountable. And it, and it places an emphasis on what we think is important. But why we are failing is a much deeper and systemic problem in the military. And so that's more of a complicated problem where you really have to understand the culture and the systems that are in place to know why we're promoting senior general officers that in the time critical moments where we need senior leaders standing for American values, we instead just have old men nodding yes, right? So how do you fix that? And that's a deeper pull. And, and yeah, I go through it in the book. I, I end with a punch card of, of 13 reasons of or ways that we can get back on track if implemented uh, sooner than later. But it's, I don't think there is a simple answer. It's, it's complicated, but there's a lot of systemic issues that need to be addressed. I hope you're enjoying this episode. Next time, 30-year 82nd Airborne Division Veteran Commander Colonel Richard Hooker will be here to discuss his book, The Good Captain, a personal memoir of America at War. If I had to pick one episode in my career, though, it, it probably would be in the summer of 99, the battalion I commanded, which was 2nd Battalion of the 505th Parachute Infantry, a battalion of the 82nd Airborne, was the lead U.S. unit into Kosovo. And uh, because of the nature of the mission, we found ourselves spread all over a, a very large area of responsibility. And, and we literally had sergeants and young lieutenants being made responsible for towns and villages far from any kind of external support. And I was just so impressed uh, and so grateful to be able to serve with soldiers of that caliber, of that kind of dedication. That's next time. And I'd like to let you know of an upcoming event on September 15th at 7 p.m. I'll be doing a public program with the National Museum of the United States Army. I'll be discussing my book, Immortal Valor, virtually online. And I hope you can join me September 15th at 7 p.m. The event is free, and there's a link to register in this episode's description. Switching topics a little bit, and... Uh, I know you're actually on the campaign trail right now for a candidate. Yeah. Um, I read where you were thinking of throwing your hat into the ring in 24, and it seems like you've already started on the political path. Could you speak to that? I've been very active supporting candidates. You know, I haven't done anything uh, for myself in terms of a political platform. Right now, I'm just trying to, in this 22 cycle, support people that I think have courage. So right now, I'm, I'm doing this interview from New Hampshire. This is the second time I've been in New Hampshire supporting Senate candidate Don Bolduc. He was a one-star general that was one of the few people that spoke out against the Afghanistan withdrawal. You can go back and Google his op-ed in February 2021. And he's the type of leader we need in the Senate Armed Forces Committee. And right now it's a Democratic incumbent. And I, Don, right now, that New Hampshire primary is really late. It's not until uh, the middle of September, which is mm. crazy because he only has then two months to go into the general, but he is leading a massive lead in the polls for the, the primary. So I'm very confident he'll get out of the primary. And then it's, can he win with someone with a huge war chest uh, as the incumbent? But I, he's the type of leader that I want to see. So I like him, I'm going around and supporting people like him 
try to get them into office. And, and while doing it, you know, I'm learning how you conduct a town hall, how you talk to people and how you run a campaign, because this is all new to me. And so I'm learning. And yes, I, I think I'd probably, I don't want to be a politician. I think I'd prefer to be in a think tank reading and writing, but the problem with the think tank, like all other things, you come up with this great idea and then you ultimately have to give it to politicians to act on it. And the people that I see in politics right now just don't have the courage or seem to be doing the things they need to be doing. So, you know, I always look, talk to people and I say, you know, it's great that you identify the problems, but what are you doing about it? And, you know, I can identify the problems all day, but if I'm not brave enough to go out there and try and do something about it, then it's all for nothing. So for those reasons, I, I do probably see a path heading to politics, but where and, and under what capacity, I'm not sure yet. I just moved back to Ohio. So I have residency there. So if, if I do, it'll probably end up being in Ohio and, and we're waiting to see how everything plays out. Is this candidate you're supporting now is uh, lean conservative? Yeah, he is. A, he's a Republican. Um, so he's in the Republican GOP primary right now. But, you know, Don is, in my opinion, different. Right. So he he stands for leadership. He's not going to go there and vote for the same Senate majority leaders. He's not he's going to take every senator. A lot of people don't know this. Every senator gets a three million dollar budget for a staff. And most of those people spend it on a staff in D.C. Don's got this unique idea where he's going to pay to have a representative in each county of New Hampshire. And then he's going to take the federal money and push it to them and figure and hold them accountable for how they disseminate it. And so there's just a lot of good ideas he has. Yeah. You know, who knows? Oftentimes people go up there and it changes. But I really believe that he's different. And so that's the type of people I want to see get in office. Well, hopefully politics are changing because it's, in my view, it's it's a broken, broken system right now. Well, I think most American people believe that. I think I saw a poll the other day that was like only 16 percent of people trust or believe that politicians are doing the right thing. Right. So the very low approval rating, <laughs> but you know, at the same time, I think everyone recognizes that it's, it's one person is probably not going to change it. It requires almost a movement and a lot of courageous people willing to say some uncomfortable things. And so oftentimes I think people just stare at the problem and say, it's not going to, it's not going to change. When I made my statement in the military, well, that's a lot of the argument was Stu, you're right, but you're not going to change anything. There's just going to be one less Lieutenant Colonel. And my point is, if we subscribe to that mentality, then we're already defeated. We've already lost, right? We need people that, even though the problem is so huge, are willing to keep attacking it. And then once you have one, then you have two, and then you have five, and then it just starts picking up momentum. And really, quite honestly, it's my generation that needs to wake up because you know we're, we're young. We're, we've seen what's going on. We all identify the problems. Now is the time that people should start getting active. Yeah, and I agree. And to that point, your prior point, there were, when you came out with the video, I read several um, commentaries about it that said, well, why didn't he wait? He was just so close to retirement, and um, he could have come out after, you know, retired and, and not lost essentially everything. And I saw that many, many times. So the courage it took to do what you did is incredible. So I want, you know, people. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't understand that. <laughs> I think the timeliness of the message was critical. I think all the general officers that five years down the road, write a book and talk about how it was a failure, which they're all going to do. It doesn't help the timely assessment to improve the system now. And I'm, I'm not quite honestly, people just continuing to wait for the next thing. You're always going to be waiting. There is, a, there is a need at times for timely assessment, whether that's failure or success, and you got to have the courage to do it. So yeah, I got it. It would have been easier for my personal stability to wait three years, but it wouldn't have had the impact that it had um, had I not had the courage to do it when I did it. Absolutely. Now, thinking about your military career, going back to your leadership roles, ending as a battalion commander right before you left the military, what are your thoughts on the military if if soldiers, young soldiers are aspiring uh, to command? What would you advise them? Well, I don't think you should ever be in the military aspiring to command. You should be in the military aspiring to serve the junior enlisted and to leave America a better place than you found it. And if you do that, everything else falls into place. I do think the military today has one of the, the best young officer and junior enlisted talent pool in the world, bar none. 
The problem is the senior leadership. It needs to be cleaned up. It needs to be reformed because really it's just a strangle on the young talent that we have where it's time-based. It's not performance-based. It's based on your boss liking you and the, the poor leadership at the top is controlling the culture. And, and that needs to, that's what needs to be fixed. I see. Yeah. So it's more about not aspiring to command, but aspiring to make your soldiers better. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Now, uh, thinking back to um, getting back to the book and in that time since uh, you released the video, have the, I, I probably know the answer to this, but uh, have there been those moments in the quiet times where you've, you've looked at the upheaval in your life and you said, well, maybe I should have approached that differently or <laughs> second guessed some things? Yeah, I mean, every human does that. I mean, to yeah. say that you never do that it would be disingenuous, right? Obviously, I have. And there's still things that I probably, if I could go back and tweak, I would tweak. But you're never perfect. When you're running through a minefield, you're going to set off some mines. The important thing is that you keep moving forward. So it's not really healthy to live in the past. You know, I'm not a victim. I made decisions that I understood the ramifications of. And I, I'll be just fine. I'll, I'll end up on top. I'll keep moving forward. And so, yeah, of course, I, I think of those things, but I try not to let, uh, you know, my doubts and my concerns and my worries and the what ifs consume me. I try to stay focused on what's in front of me. I see. And uh, final question, because of your, you're out on the campaign trail. What has the reaction been? Do people recognize you? Do they support you? Yeah, I, the, the campaign trails that I've been on, people, American people love me now. I'm going and talking to a conservative group of people when I'm out on these campaign trails. So I acknowledge it's a specific demographic and I'll post, I just published an article, an opinion piece in real clear politics. And I don't get on Twitter a lot. I'm, I'm mostly on like Facebook and LinkedIn and Instagram. And so I posted on Twitter and there was just a ton of hate of, I mean, t t talking like I should burn in hell type of hate. And so like, I got it. It's out there. Um, very few of those people actually say that to my face. In fact, no one has come even close to that talking to my face. I had one guy who came up to me and said he disagreed with me, but we had a civil conversation about it. And I don't know if I changed his mind, but I actually thanked him for having the courage to come up and have like a, a healthy debate with me about it. And so, yeah, there's everyone's got opinions, but all I can do is what I think is right. And in, in the trail, the campaign trail that I've been on, it's been overwhelming support. That's great. Great to hear. The book is called Crisis of Command. And Stu, it's out, the book is out now. Stu, thanks so much for coming on. Thanks. Thanks for having me. That's it for this episode. Thanks so much for joining me. Next time, 30-year 82nd Airborne Division Veteran Commander Colonel Richard Hooker will be here to discuss his book, The Good Captain, a personal memoir of America at War. If I had to pick one episode in my career, though, it, it probably would be in the summer of 99, the battalion I commanded, which was 2nd Battalion of the 505th Parachute Infantry, a battalion of the 82nd Airborne, was the lead U.S. unit into Kosovo. And uh, because of the nature of the mission, we found ourselves spread all over a, a very large area of responsibility. And, and we literally had sergeants and young lieutenants being made responsible for towns and villages far from any kind of external support. And I was just so impressed uh, and so grateful to be able to serve with soldiers of that caliber, of that kind of dedication. That's next time. And I'd like to let you know of an upcoming event on September 15th at 7 p.m. I'll be doing a public program with the National Museum of the United States Army. I'll be discussing my book, Immortal Valor, virtually online. And I hope you can join me September 15th at 7 p.m. The event is free, and there's a link to register in this episode's description. And if you like what you hear, leave a rating, a review, or just click the follow button. You can find me on Twitter, at Rob Child. I'm Robert Child, and this has been Point of the Spirit. Music licensed from audioblocks.com. Point of the Spear is produced by RSC Media Group.